Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome to the Marketing That Grows Your Business show. Today, we're going to be talking about something that I think a lot of people, one, may not be aware of, two, absolutely need, and arguably three, hopefully will give you a path to getting the outcome from today. So let me kind of explain what I'm talking about. If you are overwhelmed, you're wearing all the hats, you need help, you know you need help, but you're not quite sure uh, how to go about that. What does that look like? Um, how, what order you hire in all those things, then you are in the right place because we're going to be talking to our special guest today about basically operations in your business. And um, I would argue that, and I'm just going to say this from my own personal experience, Wow, I didn't know what I didn't know. I have uh, honestly uh, built, and you can, by the way, build successful businesses without this knowledge. But when you have this knowledge, OMG, it is a game changer. So what do I mean by that? I mean, if you actually understand and have somebody doing the operational side of your business, it makes a huge difference. Huge I can't even say the word huge too many times, seriously. <laughs> so as you guys are coming in, give me a shout out. Where in the world are you? Um, good morning. We got Chris in the house from Southern California. Good morning, Chris. Glad to see you. Um, yes. Yeah, so absolutely, you're going to need to hear this. I'm telling you, I this is probably the biggest. If I had to put my finger on one thing, literally, that has made the biggest impact from a a uh, scaling perspective, it would absolutely be what we're getting ready to talk about. I had to learn this and I have a story. I'll share that story with you in just a second. But again, as you guys are coming in, just give me a shout out. Where in the world are you this morning? Um, I am still in Virginia. And, I, you know, was, I think I've shared this before. We may, I think we're just going to stay. We're liking it. Seasons, y'all. Seasons. Uh, you know, when we uh, living in 18 years in Tampa, no seasons. Um, and so there is leaves turning beautiful colors here in the state of Virginia. <laughs> it's just incredibly beautiful right now. Um, good morning, Paul. Always glad to see you. I bet there's leaves up in Maryland turning as well. Hey, Nancy. I, yeah, I didn't know uh, who the Facebook user was. So it's good to put a name to a face there. Uh, I hate that sometimes when you're in a group, Facebook doesn't let your you know, your, your name come through. So glad to see you this morning. All right. So a couple of quick things. Uh, and before we bring our special guest in, um, we are doing giveaways today, like on all the shows today, we're going to be giving away a couple of things that are related to the topic at hand. One is a book that has really made a tremendous difference when we were trying to figure out this whole journey that we're getting ready to share with you. And that book is Rocket Fuel. Uh, so we're going to give away one copy of Rocket Fuel uh, to a special winner, a special one of you guys that are uh, um, on the show today. And we're also going to be giving away a Chaos Coordinator T-shirt to one lucky winner today. Now, you, this will make more sense um, as we get going because, you know, lots of times when our, in our business, behind the scenes, it is chaos. Like it, I've often said, it's like, uh, especially during launches and high, high target things where you're, you're a lot of moving pieces and parts. It's like, there's this calm on the top of the water and then the duck feet are just going, going, going. Right. So there's a lot of chaos in, in many t cases in our business. Wouldn't it be nice if somebody else handled your chaos? Hmm. Right. It would be kind of nice just to do what you do, focus on what you do best, and then let somebody else figure out all the pieces and parts. So how do you win the goodies today? So like I say, we're going to give away one chaos uh, coordinator t-shirt and one copy of rocket fuel. So you win by three, three different ways, sharing your aha moments in that area down under, uh, essentially an aha moment is, wow, didn't know that, needed to know it. Um, or sometimes, let's just be real, you know it, but you haven't taken action on it. You needed to hear it again. Somebody need to kick you in the butt a little bit. That's an aha moment. So use the hashtag aha. That's how we um, add you to the will of wow. And we draw our winners at the end of the show. Okay. Um, 
tag someone or uh, sprinkle this out into the world uh, so that we can get as many people getting in the know on this as possible. And then third, ask questions. We love, love, love questions. We'll try to take them as we go. If we don't get to them, we will absolutely circle back at the end. Okay. So definitely make sure you share um, any of your aha moments, tag someone that you think may need this and we'll go from there. Just wanted to give a shout out to Tanya. Um, welcome Tanya. Glad you're here. Awesome. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit about our special guest today. Um, Jana has over five years experience as a COO and operations consultant for seven and eight figure digital entrepreneurs. She specializes in matchmaking CEOs and operators, combining their superpowers to scale businesses. Her passion lies in serving purpose-based businesses and partnering with CEOs to unlock their highest potential and impact. So y'all put your hands together for Jana. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Jana, welcome, girl. I'm so excited that you're here. Thank you so much. I am thrilled to be here. Well, we are thrilled to have you because, like I said, I have I've got a really interesting story that I'll share in a moment about my journey down this road and why I feel it's just so impactful for literally everybody <laughs> when it comes to, you know, really getting a handle on how you get help in your business. I think we go about it in the wrong way a lot mm -hmm. of times. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I certainly have done so many times. Um, so tell us a little bit about how you have got, how you got started in the online space and like maybe the two minute version of where you are now. Totally. Okay. Um, so I like to say that before I found operations and I guess remote work as well, I was quite literally directionless. I was living in a converted sprinter van, like the hashtag van life. And we were taking this van through North and South America, just literally going wherever. Um, and so I needed to get an online job by necessity. That was the only thing that was going to enable that kind of lifestyle. And my boyfriend at the time was starting a digital marketing agency, literally two feet across the desk from me every single day. I was watching him build this business. Um, and as you do, I think you, you know, you start to weigh in, you're talking about things, you're just bouncing ideas off each other. And over time, it became clear to me that the things I was noticing about his business and the areas for improvement or the bottlenecks or the gaps were not things that he was noticing. We actually were looking at the same problem, but coming away with two completely different perspectives on it. And through a series of odd events, I ended up joining his team and eventually becoming his COO because I realized that there was a word for that and it was operations. And that it is not just a set of skills, it's not just a set of tools. It's actually a different way of looking at a business. It's a different set of considerations and problems that you want to work on and gaps that you see. And it's this natural lens that if you are this kind of natural born operator are really clear to you and very intuitive to you. But once I had a word for it, which is why I love, by the way, Kim, that you are giving away rocket fuel today, like rocket fuel was the book that gave me a label for what it was that I am, what it was that he was, right? The visionary and the integrator is what they call it in that book. And as the integrator, that gave me a label and an identity that I could actually really focus on and build a skill set around. And so over the successive years, really honing in on that craft and serving as COO for multiple businesses and consultant to many, many businesses, I was able to pull a lot of data around specifically for startups. What are the major operational gaps that they always face? What are the major patterns and behaviors that lead to success and failure? What are the major potholes that end up tripping up startup businesses and preventing them from ever truly scaling? And once I felt like I had enough data to really know what I was talking about and be able to share this with other people, uh, that's when I decided to build my own business. Just again, to educate, to share, to help other business owners avoid the major potholes and follow the major recipes for success so that they could scale their businesses successfully and ultimately scale their vision, scale their impact. And that's what I do right now. I love it. So let me share just a real quick story because I think it's so powerful um, because for anybody who's known me for any length of time on the, in the online space, I've built seven, seven figure businesses until the one I'm in right now. And I want everybody to lean in and hear this. 
Um, I didn't have the first system in my business. Mm -hmm. I was a fly by the seat of my pants gal. Um, it was always the next alligator. It was, and I didn't even realize that I had a hot mess. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. I would say, oh, I need help or I can't do the thing. And, and there's stories behind that too. But the reality was that I did not understand really that I needed the right person instead of just help. So mm -hmm. I'm going to share how I realized this and how I came to this realization. So I was at Traffic and Conversion probably five, six, I don't even know, five, probably maybe six years ago. And I um, was in a room that I got caught in. So have you ever like been in, you, you plan your uh, events, you know, the next event, the next speaker, the next thing you're going to go to. And I, I was in this room and I had just, it, 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 the speaker had stopped. They were changing out the speakers in this room. And um, I was talking to someone and I got caught in this room. Like, so I, I was embarrassed to get up in the middle of the next speaker, uh, leave, you know, and leave in the middle of their, their, their thing. Uh, so I just kept, I just kept my seat and I was like, oh, I'll just stay. It was not something I wanted to hear about or learn about my, is my point, but what an awesome like mistake to happen because the speaker who was Perry Belcher, I don't know if some of you are probably familiar with Perry and um, he was talking about, they were building an agency in, in the Philippines and it wasn't going as well as they thought it what, what should, could, whatever. And he bought some books and um, he thought all, all along, let me back up all along. He said that he thought the problem was the, the people that he had hired. Mm. And bought some books to try to figure out how he could make them do the thing, you know, that he wanted them to do better. And he realized that it wasn't them at all. It was him. Mm. And so he got to sharing the differences between um, what a visionary is and what an integrator is. I'd never heard those terms before, really, and certainly not in this context. So, I mean, everybody knows I've heard the term visionary. And, you know, so he, he used uh, examples like... Um, uh, Disney, you know, Walt was the visionary and oh, the brother. <laughs> I can't think of his name. This is terrible. <laughs> um, but his brother was the integrator. In other words, the integrator is the person who makes the vision of the, of the visionary come to life, essentially. And so uh, I was sitting there and I'm like thinking to myself, what? It's like this major light bulb went off in my head because I have an idea a minute. I'm like a flea on a hot rock. <laughs> I am the, I am absolutely, he kept going through all these, as, um, you know, traits of what a visionary is and then what a integrator is. And wow, it was just like seeing myself for what I was and understanding that that's okay, but you need the other side of the fence too. You yeah. need the other, the flip side of the coin, essentially. I, I never had had that. So yeah. I was like, oh my God. So yes, the rocket fuel became uh, a, a standard thing. You go through it, you figure out the components. It was life changing, seriously. So let me uh, get. Let's. I, I didn't mean to go on so much about that, but I think it's important to understand the two components. Can you talk a little bit about like what uh, the character traits are for those two? Yeah. And I would love if everybody, as you guys are listening to self-identify which are you are you do you are you behind the scenes like operational do you love that kind of thing or are you the visionary of of your business so talk a little bit about that so that people can get clarity on which one they are totally and guys if you want to have some fun with it rocket fuel actually has an online quiz that you can take for free to get like exact scores but to summarize i would say let's start with the visionary because i think that is probably most of your audience kim um the visionary is that like that bold charismatic leader that really has a clear picture and is drop like guiding the ship they know what it is they're trying to build and they have a million ideas a minute like that is really the defining characteristic of amazing visionaries it's like give them a problem and they will give you 30 solutions in as many minutes because that's just how their brain works they are constantly creating they're constantly innovating everywhere they look they see a new idea or a new opportunity or something that they can create and so it's this amazing creative innovative genius that is like the vision behind most businesses. You can't start a business without that kind of idea. Um, so that is the visionary role. And mostly 
uh, like in your case, they can be solopreneurs. Maybe they recognize this about themselves and have partnered with an integrator from the beginning. But most often what I see is that the visionary is going to start this company. They're going to take it as far as they can take it with that, just like sheer creative energy, as well as just like brute willpower and strength and force of will. And then at some point, their vision for the company exceeds their personal bandwidth and what they are personally able to move forward. And when that moment hits, either they realize they need an integrator or they continue to kind of flounder and flail in that space. And so the integrator is that flip side of the coin. The integrator is the operator, the expert, the behind the scenes guy. And it's funny that you couldn't remember Roy Disney's name. Like, I'm not calling you out. By definition and by desire, the integrators prefer to be behind the scenes. They don't want to be out in front. They don't want to have their face and their name everywhere. They want to do what they do best, which is take a step back and and create the actual systems, the actual team, the actual step-by-step -step that is going to make that vision a reality. And their unique genius is that you can give them your million ideas. They're not seeing the idea. They're immediately breaking that down into, okay, well, how are we going to make this happen? What's the timeline for that? Who are the people we're going to need on that team? What are the systems we're going to need to scale that, right? So their brain immediately takes that problem and starts breaking it down and reverse engineering it into the step-by-step -step that's actually going to make it a reality. And this is why the combination of the two is such a superpower because the visionary is all ideas, but fails when it comes to like that consistent scalable execution. The integrator, they wouldn't have a vision. They don't create that on their own. They need somebody else's vision that they can align with and attach to. But once they have that vision, their genius is actually turning it into a reality. And so as the ops matchmaker, like when you bring these two people together, that's when you get something that is greater than the sum of the parts. So good. And that's certainly been my experience. So for those of you, some of you know Rhonda, but Rhonda is um, my amazing, I, I mean, she wears many hats. She's, you know, we've said, okay, you're the operations manager, yeah. you're the CMO, you're the, you know, the reality, <laughs> right. she's so many things. She's not just one thing. It's hard to put a label on her because she's so many more things than just the one thing. Um, but let me ask this, because I think this is a fascinating thing. One, understanding which one you are. I think that's super powerful. That was a game changer for me in so many yeah. ways. And understanding that it was OK if I because I've always beat myself up for not being do, super detail oriented. You know, I'm yeah. like, yeah. you know, give me a spreadsheet. Um, I always laughed and said I could make money, but I couldn't manage it because I can't. The mm -hmm. I mean, making the money all day long, the management of it is not my jam. Right. Right. So, right. but I, but again, until you understand why you don't, you don't um, excel at certain things, it makes it very difficult for you to understand that that's okay, that right. you, you have a skill set that you can step into and really embrace. You just need the flip side to that coin. So I'm curious, do you think, I mean, I've done it. So I do believe uh, that from a creative standpoint and being a creative myself that because I've built successful businesses, what do you think? Can they go the other way? If you are more of an integrator, you're more detail oriented. Can you build a business without the creative spin um, if you're if your creativity is just not super deep? Mm, interesting question. So that's so funny because I feel like I'm in that position right now. Like I for years and years self-identified only as the integrator. And I told myself this story that, you know, my place was in someone else's business and that's where I shined. And so I think the, the caveat around rocket fuel is that while these labels and titles are really helpful to better understand yourself, like any other title, they are optional, right? Like you can hone any skill set that you pursue and that you put your mind to. So for me, I had to go in the other direction. I was naturally comfortable in the integrator role. I was less comfortable out in front, hopping on podcasts, right? Like presenting myself to the world. I preferred to be behind the scenes. I didn't think I was a very creative person. And in the act of building my business, um, I've had to question each of those beliefs and really rewrite my own story so that now I feel comfortable wearing both hats. Um, but that took some time. And I think it can go in either direction. It's just a matter of, you know, what is the role that ultimately is fulfilling to you? 
And while oftentimes if you're like a really strong visionary or really strong integrator, that role is going to be confined in either of those buckets, people can move back and forth. Absolutely. And it's just a question of whether that is something that you seek. It's something that you want because it's ultimately going to bring you more fulfillment and joy in your life. I totally agree with you. I'm glad you said that because I don't believe if you're stronger in one skill set or the other, or, you know, if you self-identify in one direction or the other, it doesn't mean you can't build a successful yeah. business um, yeah. because you, you just, you tend to lean more towards your comfort uh, zone, I think, but it doesn't mean that you can't step out and play the opposite. Role too. Yeah. Now I do believe though, that this is the difference uh, and, and potentially like Nancy was saying, she's like, I'm definitely a visionary, but I also have a detail oriented mind. So she has, you know, she's got both sides of the coin. My yeah. um, experience has been, you know, just find the opposite co side of the coin. Where, where do you primarily focus uh, or where, you know, if you have a problem, which direction yeah. do you, you know, what's your natural inclination? Go with the thing that's strongest and then find the person that can do the other side because otherwise you are trying to do all the things, yes. which creates a scaling problem for you. So I still believe you need to understand which one you are uh, and long term find the opposite opposite of yourself because otherwise you're, you're going to bottleneck, right? Yeah. It's just an efficiency thing, right? Like it's the same reason that you would hire anyone. Yes, yeah. you could do sales and marketing and client success and product, right? But we know that if you're trying to scale your company out at some point, it makes sense to hire in those other skill sets, even if you're great at them. Yeah. And so the integrator is just that or the visionary, right? Your counterpart is just that you could do both. And in your first six businesses, you put that on yourself to do both and you did it successfully. But could you have grown faster? Could you have grown more effortlessly? Could you have grown more efficiently having brought that person on from the beginning? Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I don't, tr I try not to beat myself up over past mistakes, but um, for those of you who are at that place where I was and didn't make that decision just purely based off of lack of knowledge, honestly, I didn't, I didn't know what I didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, and so for those of you though, that are there at that place, now my hope is you will define these roles uh, and you can make the right uh, and better decisions so that you can scale faster. Um, that's the key really, uh, is, you know, finding out stuff that you don't know and then taking action on it so that you can do different things, better things. So let's break down some terminology because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to like, what is this called? And like, does it mean the same thing? So everybody kind of knows what a virtual assistant is. A virtual assistant, I would suggest does probably just add admin type of things. They can, a lot, I think a lot of times people will hire them to do higher tier things. And then when they don't know how to do those things, they're disappointed. Right. Yeah. Um, but what is the difference between I'll, I'll say we'll we'll bump the virtual assistant down just a little bit, but maybe like a COO or an operations manager. Would you agree that they're kind of the same person or? Great question. So it comes down to like the size of your business, right? Um, if you are a five person team, you're not going to build out a operations department of three people. Um, so effectively and functionally, that first operational hire that you're making is going to play a blended role, right? They're probably going to do some admin. They're probably going to do some client success. They're definitely going to do some operations, but at what level? So the way that I think about the difference between like an ops manager being tier one, a COO being tier three, and maybe like a director of operations being tier two, is that it is um, a matter of how far into the future you want them to focus. That's the best way I can describe it. An ops manager takes what you have currently built, the systems that you currently have, and the problem and team that you have today, and they optimize it. They make it more efficient. They put systems around it. Maybe they're doing a couple of hires, but they're essentially reacting to what the day-to-day -day of the business is asking them for and needs versus a COO at the far end of that spectrum is looking way forward alongside you, right? So their future pacing, cool, 12 months out, Kim's and her company wants to be here. Well, then I'm going to reverse engineer. We're going to need these strategic initiatives. We're going to need these products and projects. We're going to need this team and these systems and that tech stack, right? So it's a matter of, and this is and this is really just on the operator side, a level of their skill. It's a factor of skill and it's a factor of experience. But how far out are they looking? Right. And how much ownership can they take 
for building that vision and creating that reality with you. Reverse engineering from 12 months or reverse engineering from 30 days out. An ops manager won't have the skill to see that far in the future and be able to confidently tell you what you need versus a COO will. Distinction. So basically, so let me let me share this. And um, and I put this together this morning and my intent isn't to um, because I, I want your feedback on it in the construct of your experience, because I put this together thinking I know what I know, but it may be wrong. OK, so I want to clarify that before. Um, Let's do it. But I, I feel like so many people, when they want help, they go right to the bottom of this list, which is mm. their virtual assistant. So if if you, you know, whatever you call yourself at the top of, of the organizational chart, it could be, yeah. you know, a CEO, a president, a visionary, you yeah. know, whatever you call yourself. And then yeah. that next tier in an online business, I feel like should be operations, an integrator, an OBM. Um, now, my next thing is, do you feel like the is there a need? Can you go from just integrator to um, to virtual assistants or are you going? And I, and I think you answered this a minute ago when you were talking about, um, you know, when you first hire somebody in operations, they wear some hats and then yep. you build out the rest of the team underneath that. Yes. My point in sharing that vis that visual with you guys is you need some things in the in between before you hire a virtual assistant. OK, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so so do you feel like an, an integrator and an operations person is the same? It's a, the term is the same. Yeah. And I think people use them interchangeably. And yeah. so I wouldn't worry too much, you guys, about the semantics and the the specific title, right? In my personal opinion, title is something that matters externally, but internally makes no difference. We're talking about function, right? And if you're making one operational hire, then their function is the same. They're a project manager and they're an ops uh, manager and they are doing administrative work, right? Like they're doing all of these things. So the question I think you're asking Kim is around like, do I need to hire in that level of skill and talent first? Or should I start with the VA and then kind of grow from there? Is that the question? So the purpose of a VA is to take off the really time intensive items off of your plate, right? So administrative billing, uh, maybe you have like some cold email outreach strategy that requires 500 emails a day and that's taking hours of your time, right? So whatever is eating up an enormous amount of your time, that's where a VA can be a really strategic hire because the cost of their time is way less than the cost of your time. And so it makes sense to invest and like put money on the table to bring in somebody that can handle all of that and give you your time back. That is different than operations, right? That's administrative, maybe it's marketing, maybe it's client success, wherever the time suck is, that's what the VA is doing. Operations is its own department. It's its own standalone thing. And so for, if you need operations, you're not just talking about, hey, can you get these things off my plate? You're asking them to design the systems, the team, the plan to scale that is going to help you go from point A to point B. So maybe that includes some administrative stuff, but it's important to distinguish that like where you would bring in a VA is to get your time back. Where you would bring in an operator is to partner with somebody who has the skill set to build your vision and turn it into a reality. And it's two separate functions, if that makes sense. It does. Yes. And, you know, one of the things um, and that's the reason I'm bringing this up is, yeah, you know, I've hired VAs before to do what you just shared, which is take take an administrative task and, you know, um, take that off my plate, essentially. But what yeah. I found in many cases, and I, I see this in a lot of people, uh, other people's businesses, they hire the VA because they need the thing done, but they don't have yeah. any systems in place. That so that the person that you hire has a framework to operate within, which creates, 
uh, you're just paying somebody for the sake of paying them. Uh, and it's easier for you to go do it than try to slow down long enough to train them to do the thing. So that's why I'm bringing this up from personal experience. I almost feel like you don't need a VA until you have some systems to support the work that you want the VA to create uh, to do for you. Um, I hired a gal uh, one time and I paid her for a whole year and it wasn't her fault. It was totally my fault that mm -hmm. I didn't have infrastructure set up to help her do the workflow. You know, yeah. so yeah. I think that's one of the reasons I'm so it's been well, I'm, I'm so focused on, you know, if you if you need help, you do need systems. I, I just didn't really realize it ever in any of my previous businesses. <laughs> so totally. um, so let, let's talk about what are the advantages of, of hiring an operations manager or an integrator, mm -hmm. um, especially in the construct of somebody who is an, uh, a solopreneur, for example, they don't really have a team yet. Um, is is hiring that first person um, uh, from a role of to making that decision first? Is it that operations person and what do they help them with? Yeah, great question. So let me give you, Kim, just the framework I use for choosing any order of hiring for any business, for any visionary. Um, who do I hire first and why? Right. Like that's a question I get all the time. Maybe that's operations. Maybe it's sales. Maybe it's marketing. How do I know? The metric that I developed to help myself think about this, I call it EHV. It's your effective hourly value. And your EHV is essentially the amount of value that you could drive into your business, the amount of revenue and gain you could bring to your company with one hour of your time. That's your EHV. And it doesn't matter if you are a solopreneur or you have a team of 20, everybody at the company has an EHV, right? Here's the maximum value I can drive. When you are asking yourself the question of who do I hire, I want you to think about the calculation as one of EHV. Take the last three days of your life as a solopreneur or as a CEO of 10, wherever in the business you are, and make a note, a task list, a time audit of all of the things that you are doing in your day to day, right? Three days, audit your time, just jot it all down. And then at the end of three days, come back to that list and rank those activities by EHV. What are the things that are driving maximum and most value into my business? What are the things that I am still doing that are necessary, right? Maybe like invoicing or emailing or something like this, but are low value activities, right? They need to get done, but they're not driving active value into the company and rank that like five to one based off of EHV, based off of value. Who you hire first is your ones and your twos. You draw a scope of work around that chunk of tasks and activities, and that's the role that you hire. Maybe that's marketing. Maybe it's administrative, in which case a VA would might, might be the best hire. Maybe it's systems building and team building and all of these things that you don't know how to do. Beautiful. Then hire an operator first. But the reason EHV is such an effective way to go about this process is that what you are doing is that you are allocating out your least valuable activities and all of that time that you're getting back can now be reallocated towards your threes, your fours, and your fives. So as you are scaling out and building your team, you're doing it strategically such that every new hire is maximizing the value add to the business because it is giving you the most amount of time back to drive into higher value activities. So this is the way that I would recommend you go about ordering your hires. And remember that a couple of things with EHV. It's not just about like what is taking up the most amount of my time or what is driving the most amount of value. It's also about what am I best at and what can only I do in the business. For me personally, just to share this, I at the start was not a very good visionary because I didn't know how to do it. And I was learning that role, the CEO role, but it was the role that only I could fill in the business. Nobody else could do it. So by that definition, CEO is always a five. CEO roles and tasks are always a five because only you can fill that position, right? If you are amazing at sales, then sales is gonna be a higher value thing for you to do. If you're terrible at sales, sales is probably going to be lower value because you're not very good at it and you could hire in somebody to do it better. So when you're thinking about EHV, take that into account. It's not just like what is, dollar signs driving the most into the business. It's also 
uh, what am I best at and able to uniquely contribute to in this team? Does that make sense, Kim? It does, yes. And, you know, I just am looking at this through my own experience too. And I'm thinking, you know, from a, for the perspective of um, the components, I didn't really know what I did. I didn't know at the time. So I kind of mm -hmm. figured it out along the way. And one of the things for us is that was a byproduct of it was, of course, the team building component, um, building this infrastructure out, the systems to support the, bringing the right people on and that kind of thing. Yeah. So that was a big, um, a big part of it. But, um, you know, when you're trying to decide who you need to hire in what order, I love how you broke that down. But I feel like sometimes we are that is not our zone of genius, meaning even though we say, hey, that's it, I, let's take a look at what we do, but we know we need somebody to help us. But the reality is I suck at managing people. I don't want to manage people. And my, you know, one of the roles for me, um, I'll just say real quick, has been uh, really great from an operation standpoint is having that operational person be in that role so that I don't have to be in that role. Totally. Um, and, and that may be some of you too is, so that's a value, a value proposition that I have found as a, a byproduct of that. But another thing that I wanted to bring out that I think is really important is, um, is the accountability factor. When you have somebody else in a, a role, that's kind of like, I, even though it, uh, a, a, an integrator or a business or, or a operations person works with, they're really, they work with you. They're a partner yes. almost, even though they, yeah. they get a salary, whatever they are for me. It's like, that's the only real person in the business that feels like they can call me on my crap. Like, you know, they're, they're a partner. They, they were, you, you spend so much time with them on a, a daily basis. Yes. And so the accountability factor is super powerful because it, they reel me in. Um, so I'm always like, like I said, always have an idea a minute, next thing, next thing, next thing. And that person for me is no, we're not doing that, Kim. Yeah. Staying on this road. <laughs> so, so anyway, I just wanted to highlight a couple of those things, value adds that I think a, a VA, or not a VA, a, um, operations person or an integrator brings to into the mix. Yeah. So, what can I speak to that really quick, Kim? Yeah, absolutely, would love. Because I think that's that's absolutely huge. And there's a lot of misunderstanding around like what does operations look like and what does an operator do in the business? And that lack of understanding means that you could bring this person in. But if you're like delegating them to these really low value tasks and things that is not operations, they're only ever going to be marginally effective and marginally valuable in that role. So what I oftentimes see people like assigned to operations is the executive assistant role, is the firefighter role, is the like, I call it the garbage collector role, just like, here's all the mess in the business here. Can you handle this? Um, and none of those are positions that fall under operations, right? None of those are operations in and of itself. An operator might have to clean up a mess because that mess is creating inefficiency in the business. But their job is to create efficiency, not clean up the mess. And so to have a clear idea of like, how does operations drive value into my company is really important for you to A, justify that investment in the first place, but then B, once that person's in, actually allow them to be successful and drive maximum value in their role. So I define operations as any action required within a business to optimize a company's use of its core resources. Those resources in a digital business are time, energy, money, and human potential. So at the core, what operations does and is, is about efficiency. The squirrel syndrome CEO, who has a million ideas a minute and is constantly like sending the company all around chasing all of these ideas, is inefficient. And so the reason that your operator serves as that accountability partner and to kind of help be the guardrails around that creative genius is because their job is to take all of that creative flow and bring it into the company in a way that is efficient, in a way that can be maximizing the value add, in a way that can create growth as opposed to chaos. So when we think about operations, we oftentimes think of like, what are all the things an operator will do? 
Well, they'll build your SOPs. They're going to build your systems. They're going to build your HR. They're going to build your team. They're going to manage your team. They're going to hold you accountable. They're going to do all of these things. But at the core, what are they doing and how are they ultimately driving growth? They're doing that through efficiency. And they're taking all of the time and the energy and the money that is just leaking out of your business currently. And they're taking that money and they're putting it back in your pocket through SOPs and meetings and systems and all of these things. And that's an important distinction, I think, to understand before you're going to make this hire so that you can set this person up for success. Mm, so good. So, and you know, one of the things I just heard and I'm like, oh my gosh, I think I've done that before, you know, to your point, like you, you, here's all the mess and yep. just handle it, you know, cause the reality is us visionaries, we don't like the mess either. No, you don't want to touch it. No. So I'm like, okay, I, I heard that. I, I did hear that. So um, well, listen, when it comes to making that decision, like a lot of times people, I, I need help, right? But how yep. do you yeah. know you need an operations person versus you went through the breakdown, right? Where, you know, finding the components in your business that are, are, um, you know, or time sucks for you. How do you hire for that person? But a bigger, I think an integrator is uh, a little harder sometimes to define when you need one. So can you like just put a definition around that? If you had like, hey, I'm, a, I'm, I'm here. I don't know exactly if I need an integrator or not. Yeah, uh, totally. Just some characteristics of a business that would need one. A hundred percent. So let's talk through like the symptoms that come up in a business when you have an operational gap or an operational problem. What you're going to see, and this doesn't matter if you're a solopreneur or you have a team of 20, doesn't matter. What you're going to see is a feeling of perpetual reactivity. Like every day you're showing up and you're just like, okay, what does my business have for me today? I'm just going to knock that out. And over time, what that leads to is this feeling of, wow, I am spending a lot of time working in my business. I am not spending a lot of time working on my business. And it feels like all of my time is getting sucked into these like reactive day to day activities when I know that I should be working on this higher level stuff, but I, I don't know how to get myself out of this corner and I don't know how to prevent myself from becoming the bottleneck in my business. That's the other thing you're going to see a lot is like, it feels like nothing is moving forward without you. It feels like your team is coming to you for everything or your clients are coming to you for everything. And you don't know how to get yourself out of the day to day. And for every new hire you bring on or every new client you close, it just feels like more and more work to you. If you are feeling any of these things, that's a symptom. The underlying root cause is a lack of operations. And the solution is not more sales, more marketing, more growth, right? I see a lot of business owners where their growth starts to plateau or roller coaster, or it'll start to slow down or stagnate. And they freak out because, and they, they default to the solution that has always worked for them, which is like, okay, well, more sales. Okay. Well, more marketing. We'll try a new offer. We'll post a new guarantee. We'll upsell some clients, right? Like they immediately go to the cash solution to this problem. When the underlying root cause is maybe that they have just money leaking out of the business in all directions and only operations can close those gaps or they as a visionary are lacking focus. And so they're constantly chasing shiny objects and that's creating this roller coaster revenue in their business and they need an operator to help like zero in their focus. Right. So I think that operations or a lack of operations shows up all over the place. Um, but ultimately what it comes down is to is just like a felt experience for you as the CEO of your company. Do you feel perpetually reactive? Do you feel like you're the only person driving things forward? Do you feel like your clients and your team are coming to you for everything every day all the time? And do you feel like slowly but surely you're getting backed into this corner where you are the bottleneck to your business and what it can become? If that's the case, then an operator is the solution to help you free yourself from that position and allow the, the company to continue to scale and grow without you being constantly present to make it happen. Yeah, I kind of, uh, you know, as I was listening to you talk, I was like, I almost feel like one way to uh, say this is because I, I feel I felt all those things. And I would love it if, if, if you guys are listening or watching, um, you know, did any of that sound familiar? Like, yeah. you know, <laughs> I, I would love to hear from you. And I feel like that a where a, an operator um, or having somebody in that integrator role alongside you is a visionary in a different direction because we can't we can't see it's a visionary in the content struct of you know trying to make your vision come to life like that's something that most visionaries or creatives struggle with they can't all the details 
um, are a problem. So, you know, the flip side to that coin is somebody who can see how to make the thing, the vision, put the pieces in place for you. So they have a vision for that side of the fence. Uh, and right. we have, if we can keep keep our focus on the other side um, where we lead the charge on that end, then that puts us, it, it's, it's a perfect dynamic, I think, is kind of what I'm um, leading up to. So for those of you who are like, like Tracy, for example, she's like, yes, 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 uh, all those things. Um, and we'll we'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute because I know this is something Jana does. Uh, but what if you're looking for somebody like what, or you're thinking to yourself, yes, I'm a creative, or I'm more organized. I I would self-identify as an integrator. Mm -hmm. um, what does the flip side of that look like? Like when you're looking for the opposite of yourself, um, what characteristics are you looking for when you're like? Hey, I need to, I know my third cousin or my sister or I, my friend has these skill sets. What, what skill sets are we looking for? Yeah, totally. So I think rocket fuel, I can't recommend it enough because it will build a really comprehensive profile for both the visionary and the integrator and give you a clear picture of like, what are you looking for? So in, if you're the visionary and you're looking for your integrator, the core skills that I assign to any world-class operator are a couple of things. Uh, number one, obviously like organization and attention to detail. That is a non-negotiable deal breaker for you to be successful in this role. Number two, they have to be absolutely growth oriented because the only thing guaranteed about the operational role is that it is going to ask them to evolve right alongside you in the way your company is asking you to evolve. So they have to be adaptable, flexible, and constantly willing to learn new skills, to, to tackle new projects, to take on things they've never tried before because that's what the company is asking them to do. Number three, and this one is a little bit harder to describe, but I call it level three thinking. And when I shared my story all the way at the beginning, of it, like, it felt like I had a different worldview, a different lens than my partner and what he was seeing when he looked at the business. What I'm talking about is level three thinking. It is this way that your brain works, where you are taking any problem, any system, anything that you're looking at, and you are immediately, like your brain, you can't turn it off, is just breaking it down right? It is reverse engineering it into what are all of the various parts that are at play here and how do they fit together? How do these two systems interact and what's the outcome and the consequence of that? How does this thing over here actually relate to this thing over here? And how does this problem that we're seeing as this tiny little issue right now, how is that actually going to have massive effects six months down the road, right? Like if what I'm describing right now makes no sense to you at all, you're probably a visionary. If what I'm describing to you right now makes perfect sense, you're probably an integrator because that level three thinking is the number one thing that I look for when I'm assessing out whether somebody has the raw potential to be amazing in operations. The best operators all think this way. All you need to do after that is layer on some tools and some skills and some training, and they're going to be absolutely fantastic. But if you lack that underlying lens, and as a creative, that's not how your brain is working at all, it's going to be a struggle and it is going to be much harder for you to kind of muscle your way into that skill set. So if you're a visionary looking for your integrator, that's what I would look for. Growth orientedness, absolutely detail oriented. And that level three thinking of this person is just naturally organizing systems oriented. It, they're a puzzle solver and everything they look at is a puzzle for them to solve. I agree. So I think he was uh, had a great question. She's like, but don't your clients expect to get their answers from the CEO and not the mm. operations leader? I, I'm just going to just just jump in real quick on that. And then I'll love your take on it, too. But I think that the operations uh, uh, manager or the integrator is usually behind the scenes. They're not usually somebody that is in front of the client. Um, to answer your question. Now that said, there are instances where um, in my business in particular, where the operation side of the business is super powerful for my students. So absolute that she does things that I don't know how to do. Mm -hmm. And and she and in that case, bringing her forward uh, in, in that role is is super powerful. So do you agree in, you know, uh, with that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I've seen it done both ways, where if an operator, interestingly, a lot of like account managers or client success managers 
have personality traits that actually lend themselves to operations very well. And so I've seen a lot of business owners where they'll take their existing account manager and kind of layer in the operations role and slowly evolve that person towards operations, which can be really effective. So if you have an operator who is also great at client success, then maybe they are front facing, but that's not a precursor to being in the operations role. To your point, Kim, I agree operations as a separate function is behind the scenes and is not client facing. That being said, and I think it was Vicky who asked this question, Vicky, you're going to have to cross this bridge at some point, right? If you want to scale your company to the size where you have a client success team and you're handling and serving more clients than you can personally connect with and communicate with, then you're going to have to figure out how to kind of transfer that authority to somebody else on your team whether that be a client success manager or an operator, you're going to have to reconfigure your client relationship and that client psychology so that they're excited and they treat that member of your team as the authority that speaks on behalf of the company and ultimately speaks on behalf of you. So if you are a solopreneur, I know that that can be a really difficult thing to give up. And we put these expectations in our own head of like, oh, our clients aren't going to listen to anybody except for us that's because they haven't had to yet. And it's just going to require a little bit of creative thinking, probably from your operator, of what is the system, what is the onboarding process, what's the launch call that is going to reposition this other point of contact within the company as that authority that your clients look up to, they respect, they trust, and they can partner with. Such a good answer, because I totally agree. And that's something we've had to do, even with customer service. Like, you know, and I mean, the, you get to a place in your business, you cannot respond to every, I mean, that's been my biggest even struggle, even social media, the fact that I can't talk to everybody anymore, that it's just not feasible for me to be able to do it. And man, did I like kick and scream uh, when I had to release that, because it had always been my like sweet spot, like, right. Mm -hmm. And it still mm -hmm. is, honestly, it's just that I just cannot manage all of it anymore. So I've had to focus on really, okay, what are the higher tier things that give, bring the company and the value that I can showcase more robustly because it goes, it really is all about the people I serve at the end of the day. So how do I fix some of the things that I've done in the past to present a different option or a different alternative for that. Um, and then I can do the higher level things. Yeah. So it's just been a difficult, it is difficult to release, I think, to your point. Well, let's, let's I think kind of wrap really quick, Kim, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. That is just like a perfect example of EHV, right? And like this thought process that I shared with you guys earlier in the session of like, you might be amazing at client success. You might have these incredible relationships with your client, but as your client base grows, it is eating up more and more and more of your time to continue to fill that role. And the reality is, is that if the ultimate goal here is service and the ultimate goal here is impact, your highest value towards that is not to answer every individual social media message and not to speak to every client FAQ. It's to be the CEO of the company and to drive growth in the way that only you can as CEO and build an amazing team or hire an operator to build an amazing team that is still going to show up and serve your clients really, really well, but it's going to free up your time so that you can focus on higher levels of service, higher levels of impact by just reaching more people, right? And so I think we have to be really disciplined with ourselves and with our time around like, is this the highest value thing I could be contributing to my company and to my clients? Because even if you're brilliant at it, it might be time to let it go because there's higher value activities that your company needs from you. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's been amazing. Yeah. So I know one of your like zones of genius is matchmaking people that have said, you know, if you're like, say, like, for example, Tracy's like, yes, 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 you are describing me, I am there. So if you resonated with, I've got these problems, I'm doing way too many things. I, you know, I know I need help, but I, I need some higher tier help, help essentially. Yeah. Um, yeah. You are a great matchmaker to the business owner, or the visionary or to the integrator. So can you talk a little bit about that, how you do that or what the process looks like? If somebody would like to work with you, what would that look like? Kind of give us a little spill on that. Totally, yeah, I'll do the brief overview. So like Kim said, we consider ourselves to be the matchmaker. If you're a business owner and I've described you to a T this episode and you recognize that 
wow, I need an operator. And I don't think I have that person on my team. Like in the way that she described an integrator, nobody in my life or in my team is coming to mind. I think I need to go out and find this person. And I have no idea how to do that. Then we would work with you on one of our hiring solutions. So hiring and operational recruiting is absolutely something that we provide. And that's if you don't have that operator already. If something I said like, oh, actually, maybe my account manager could fill that role and she's doing a lot of the things that Jonna just described. Maybe I should have a chat with her about this. And you determine like, oh, I do have that operator on my team. They're just hidden and I didn't recognize them before, but I think they'd be fantastic and I want to work with them long term. Then we also have the Ops Academy, which is a series of training programs for the operators specifically, because a lot of operators don't know that this is their superpower and they don't know how to drive maximum value either. So if you're on the visionary side and you need that operator, we can help hire that person for you. If you have that operator, you think you have that operator, we can also train that person up. And if you are an operator or you feel like that could be your zone of genius, we also put students through that program and then place them into digital operations roles on the far end of the program. Good, so good. So summon that up. If you know you need somebody, but you don't know exactly how to do it, reach out. Where do they reach out to you, Jana? Yeah, so probably the best way to get in touch with me, guys, um, our new website is coming up soon. So that's www.spyglassops.com. Right now, that would just redirect you to uh, my personal website, which is johnalee.com. Either domain will work for you, um, but there's going to be a option for you on there to get in touch directly with my team. And we have a genuine discovery chat with every single person that connects with us. Like we want to break down what is going on in your business? What are the operational bottlenecks you're currently facing? Is it operations? Like, is that actually your problem? And if it is, beautiful. Then we can talk about potentially partnering up to help you find that person and help scale your business. Excellent. All right. All right, y'all, if you know you need help, reach out to Jana. okay? So real quick, I want to uh, say congrats to our winners for today's giveaways. Rocket Fuel, if you did not win it and you know you're intrigued, you need to learn more, go buy Rocket Fuel. I cannot stress enough. I'm with John on that. It's an amazing book. But Lisa won today a copy of Rocket Fuel. So Lisa, excited for you uh, to win this. And we also have Cheryl who won the Chaos Coordinator T. If you are, by the way, uh, an integrator or you feel like you lean more in towards that, you need the Chaos T-shirt, the Chaos Coordinator <laughs> T-shirt, because there is no better word for that. It's like all the crap that happens behind the scenes in your business, that person is in charge of that. So, I love that. <laughs> definitely. So if you don't have a chaos coordinator t-shirt, you can get one at Kim Gadot's store. Just plug in my store real quick. Anyway. All right. So go check out Jana, connect with her. Please, please, please. I think you'll learn a lot from her. Um, Jana, thank you so much for sharing your amazing wisdom with us. Thank all of you guys for being with us today. Um, as always, we appreciate your time and uh, we'll see you next week. Same time, same place. Take care of yourselves. Stay safe and God bless. Thanks, everybody.